So in this video, I'm going to show you everything involved in publishing your website on the internet. So whether you are an experienced developer, you already know how to build websites, or whether you've been following my course, which I made on Django and web development, um, this, this video is going to be kind of an all encompassing everything you need to know about hosting your website on uh, using DigitalOcean, using the host provider DigitalOcean. I'm going to show you everything from creating an account, choosing what kind of server, what kind of system, logging on, setting up SSH private keys, setting up a firewall. I'm just reading my list here. Um, disabling password authentication, so you're using SSH to log in. Um, installing Python, choosing the correct version of Python, installing PIP, creating virtual environment, um, using system sockets and setting up G-Unicorn and Nginx, which is what you use to run your server and, and uh, host, or I guess, yeah, run your server would be the way to put it. Uh, testing socket activation, testing Nginx, registering a domain name. So that means choosing a domain name that your website is gonna have, just like my website, codingwithmitch.com. So you get an IP address from DigitalOcean, then you buy a domain name and you can point your name servers to that IP address. Um, setting up HTTPS on your server, on your website, so that it uses HTTPS and not HTTP. Um, and then also object storage with Django. So uh, this is actually done with Amazon Web Services. I didn't know this, but <clears throat> DigitalOcean has their own sort of um, object storage. So it's a place to store images and what other, other kind of media, static files basically for your website. DigitalOcean is something called DigitalOcean Spaces S3 that does that, but it actually uses Amazon Web Services. So that's kind of interesting, um, but it, it's, it's much easier to use than uh, using Amazon Web Services alone, I find. So I'll show you how to set up all that stuff. Um, decoupling settings for security. So that's like having a separate settings file instead of using the actual settings file for Django. That way it's uh, more secure. Uh, and sending emails. So like in the, in the course, I showed you how to do a password reset. So you send a password reset to the user if they forget their password. Um, but that wasn't done using a production environment. So this is going to show you how to do that in a production environment. And then when this is all done and your website is hosted, I'm going to show you how to build a REST API also. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with my content, I'm going to be showing you how to build an Android app after that to communicate with that REST API. So lots, lots of stuff, lots of stuff. And like I said, most of the things that I just mentioned, I'm going to cover all in a single video. I'm going to put timestamps down in the description for kind of the, the points, the checkpoints, I guess, if you will. And uh, you can just keep referring back to this video. If you ever need to publish a website using DigitalOcean, um, you know, whether it's th from one of my courses or from your just your own websites that you're building on your own. Uh, also, there will be a link in the description for a DigitalOcean sign up link if you want to support my channel. This is a completely free course that I made. The only thing I really get out of it is. Um, no, I mean, YouTube ad revenue, but that's almost nothing. So there's, there's a link for a digital ocean sign up. Uh, make sure to click that below. There's also a link for a, uh, a link to namecheap.com, which is where you should buy your domain. There'll be a link down there. If you use those links, I get like, I don't know, a couple bucks per sign up or something like that. If, if you guys use those, so I would appreciate that. All right. So that was the intro. That was long. There's a lot of stuff, but now let's, uh, let's get into the content. And the first sort of thing that I'm going to talk about is the prerequisites. So what do you need to know before you watch this video? What are, what's, what's everything you need to know, basically, so you don't waste, waste any time. So let's uh, talk about the prerequisites. So the first thing I want to talk about is why am I using DigitalOcean to host this website? There's tons of hosts out there. There's, you know, some of them you might be familiar with is like HostGator, Bluehost, um, I don't know. Those are the ones that come to mind anyway. So, and, uh, so now let's talk about why I like DigitalOcean and why I use DigitalOcean for any of my hosting needs today. So the first thing is they have excellent customer service. I've had nothing but good experiences with their customer service. And this is very important for any kind of any company or any host provider in particular, because you very often run into problems and being able to jump on a live chat with someone really quick and just ask some simple questions is uh, really handy. It can save you a lot of time. So that's point number one. Second, actually, this should have been probably the first point is they have excellent documentation. Like they have the best documentation. It's not confusing. It's straight to the point. 
There's great tutorials taking you through whatever you need to do, which I'm going to be referring to throughout this video. I'm going to be showing you, you know, uh, the ones that I followed to do the tasks that we're going to be doing that way. You can very easily refer to those in your own development uh, on your own time. So yeah, excellent documentation, like among the best documentation I've ever seen personally, I think. So that's that should have been reason number one, not the customer service, but I guess they're sort of the same category. So that brings me to the third point, the pricing. Pricing is very reasonable. My website, codingwithmitch.com, for example, gets between 1,000 to 1,500 visits per day currently usually. And I've never paid more than I think $14 a month for server fees. Now that's not including serving the static files and serving the media because that's a different cost completely. That's using Amazon Web Services. But just strictly the server fees is only about 14 bucks a month and they have had nothing but good service provided to me. So that's really great. And that brings me to the fourth point, their service. Their service is just overall really great. I talked about customer service already, but just I, I mean like their the raw service that, that I'm paying for. I've had nothing, I've had no bad experiences. You know, my, serv my server's never gone down. It's never done anything weird that I didn't want it to do. It's just very been very consistent and very good. So um, yeah, not, literally nothing but good things to say about DigitalOcean. So that's why we are gonna be using DigitalOcean. And I'm sure if you ask the developer community, if you go on forums, go on Reddit, whatever, everybody's gonna say the same thing about DigitalOcean. Now let's talk about cost. So you are gonna need a credit card. Hosting is not free. To put a website up on the internet is not free. Um, at least as far as I know, it's it's not free. I've never seen anything, any free service out there. Maybe there's like student things you could get, but I'm, I'm really not sure. So you are going to need a credit card because you need a DigitalOcean account and you need to be able to pay for your server fees. Like I said, if you're not hosting any kind of media files, it's only going to cost you about... 13 14 dollars canadian a month which is i think about eight or nine dollars us a month so very very cheap like you you're never gonna do anything cheaper in terms of uh, de your development life um so you know it's worth it it's well worth it um so you can pay for a credit card you can play with a credit card or you can pay using paypal i believe i'm not 100 percent sure on that i pay with a credit card and uh yeah like i said it'll be 13 14 bucks a month which is about nine dollars us around there and uh, you'll also need to buy a domain name so DigitalOcean is the server that the website will be hosted on that will just get you an ip address but if you want to point it to you know codingwithmitch.com or coding with uh coding with whatever your name is dot com whatever your, your domain uh, you choose is going to be you need to buy that and we're going to be using uh, a website called namecheap to, to purchase that. And like I said, I have a link down in the description of this video for to, to point you to uh, Namecheap. And I get like a, cu a couple, I don't know, like a dollar or something for a referral fee, I don't know. But anyway, hosting, uh, the domain name itself is very cheap. Uh, the one that I bought for this course, just to show you, is only a dollar per year. So very, very low cost. All right, so the last thing I wanna talk about is the software that you're gonna need to watch this video, to move forward with this video. The, the only thing you need is you need something to SSH or do FTP onto your server. So something to log on to your server system, which is gonna be a Unix system, and something to send files to your server, which is uh, done using something known as FTP. It's like File Transfer Protocol, I believe is what it stands for. So the, the software that I recommend using is called MOBA Xterm, and I'll bring it up on my screen here. So this is what the software looks like. Basically, you just use it to log into your server so you can do things, you can upload files. I like this because you can do both FTP and log into the Unix operating system all from the same application. Some of you might be familiar with a very popular uh, SSH piece of software called Putty. That's a very common one. But this is just, I think this one's just better. Like it saves your passwords. You can have multiple tabs open. You can, like I said, FTP and SSH at the same time. It's just, it's pretty convenient and it's free. So uh, you can just go to, this is the website right here, MobaXterm, MobaTech.net, download it. Very simple, and we're going to be using that throughout the uh, video here. So, whether you use Putty and an, a different FTP, use whatever you want. This is just what I'm going to be using. So, just keep that in mind. All right. So now that we're kind of done the intro, we're done the prerequisites. Let's uh, work. Let's start working on setting up our server. So, like I said, we're using DigitalOcean, and there's a link in the description of this video to link you to DigitalOcean to give me some credit for pointing you to DigitalOcean. Thank you very much if you do choose to do that, to 
click that link because YouTube doesn't really pay very much and this is a this is a free course. So thank you if you do click the link in the description for signing up to DigitalOcean. And that should take you to this page, I believe. Then you want to click sign up and create an account. Obviously, I already have an account, so I'm just gonna log in. So when you log in, this is kind of like your dashboard that you have. And you're not gonna see any money up here yet because you obviously don't have anything hosted. You don't even have your credit card set up or anything like that. This is actually the, the project for codingwithmitch.com. Um, it's just a very, very uh, small system. I only use uh, 512 megabytes of RAM with a 20 gig disk, so very small. And, it, and like I said, my website gets between 1,000 and 1,500 visits a day and everything is excellent. So don't, you don't need a lot to be running your website, um, at least with that kind of traffic. So uh, once you come to the dashboard, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna create a new project. So I've already created another new project here. It's called Coding with Mitch Blog Course. If I was to create a new project, you just enter a name, a description, select the purpose. You can probably go website or blog, which is what we're gonna do, and then create that project. And then you should be looking at this, this screen right here. So you'll have pretty much kind of nothing in here. And uh, I'm not sure, you're gonna wanna also probably set up your credit card information. So you wanna go, I think it's an account, and you can go to billing and you can uh, set up your credit card information but because uh, you will need that to start your hosting. Obviously, I'm not going to click that because I don't want you to see my credit card stuff, but that's where you're going to want to go. Once that's all set up, come back to your project and let's uh, create a new droplet in DigitalOcean, basically a server or a service that you want to use. They're called droplets. So I believe you can, you can get it from up here too. Yeah, you can go create a new droplet or you can uh, just get started with a droplet right here. Oh, and just kind of as an FYI, this is the documentation that I'm going to be following for this video, how to install Django Web Framework on Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu I'm not really sure how to say that, 18.04. Basically, I'm following this entire documentation. I'm going to be taking you through that. So if you are curious, you know, here, here's the link and you can, you can visit that or you can just search in the tutorial section, search DigitalOcean and look for uh, this this link if you if you want to follow along kind of with the video or whatever So let's let's create that droplet. So the uh, first thing is creating or choosing a system I'm gonna be using Ubuntu or Ubuntu whatever it's called like I said 64-bit system 18 version 18.04 uh, Choose a plan standard plan It has it the $40 a month option selected by default But we can go way back and we're gonna choose the $5 a month per option um, it, which is plenty for us. Like I said, codingwithmitch.com only uses 512 megabytes of RAM or CPU and uh, 20 gigs of disk. So this is way more than even my website has. They've actually increased the lowest possible option since I made codingwithmitch.com. So this will be plenty for you. Nice $5 a month option. Uh, we want to enable backups, which costs an extra dollar per month. This is a very convenient service because if you ever have to reset your server kind of start at square one or not square one but you know say you screwed up your server and you want to go back and revert to what it was like the day before um, that you can use backups for that so it's really handy definitely something you want to have because if you screw up your server and chances are you're going to i know i have having these backups is uh, pretty pretty awesome uh, looks like it does once a week though but either way better than not having it Next is choosing your data center region. I, I, I like to choose New York because it's more central to the typical people who are going to be using your website. Like, so it's on the Eastern side of, of uh, North America, which is close closer to Europe. If you choose San, San Francisco, yeah, you get, uh, you know, all of North America, but the other side of the world is farther away. So I, I like to choose New York because it's closer to, Europe, Africa, the other side of the world. Um, I'm pretty sure they do automatic load balancing anyway. So it will like find people, it'll use a data center that's closest to the people who are direct, the traffic is coming from anywhere. So I don't know if that matters that much, but I choose New York every time. Uh, some other options, I'm not gonna choose any of those. We This is very important. We wanna use a one-time password to sign into your server. And I wanna use a one-time password because later we're going to be enabling SSH authentication or SSH private key authentication. And in order to do that, in order to enable that, we need to have one-time password set up. So do not click this because later we're gonna be enabling SSH private key authentication uh, later in this video. So it's much, much, much more secure. So one-time password is what you want for now, and then we're gonna do that later. 
we want one droplet. You can choose a, choose a name. Pretty much this just describes what the system properties are. It doesn't really matter. And uh, you can add some tags. So like this could be like, you know, coding with Mitch blog course or whatever. I'm just going to leave this blank, have no tags. And uh, you assign to a project and then you create the droplet. And now DigitalOcean will create this system on their servers. All right, so once your system is ready, that means that you can actually log into your server. So what you wanna do is you want to copy the IP address and we're gonna to go to MOBA Xterm, which you should have downloaded and installed by now. And uh, you'll also have an email, you'll also have got, received an email with your, uh, your password to log in with. So I'm not gonna show my email, but um, you would just log into your Gmail or log into whatever you signed up with Dig DigitalOcean with and um, it will send you your SSH password, which will be like a long, long, very long of like random letters and numbers, like a whole bunch of stuff. That'll be your password. So use that to, and um, copy that. And we're gonna go to MOBA X term and log in. Actually, I wasn't gonna show you, but I guess it doesn't really matter. It's just like the, the IP address, the username and the password. I'm gonna change the password anyway by the time you're watching it. So. So here is what the email that you'll get. So what you'll want to do is copy the IP address, which you should have already. We're gonna to go to MOBA Xterm, go to session, create a new SSH session. The remote host is the IP address. We're gonna go specify username and type in root, because that is the username that you were emailed, as you can see there. And uh, now I'm going to copy this password. So I'm copying that. I'm gonna go back to my, my uh, MOBA Xterm, clicking OK and now it's gonna ask me for the password. So because I have the password copied, I'm just going to paste it in. Nothing will show, but it actually was pasted in. So if I click enter, it's gonna say, do I wanna save it? I'll say no. And there we go, I'm signed into the server. So now it's asking me for the current password again. So again, I'm gonna right click, go to paste, click enter. Now it's saying enter a new password and I'm going to enter a new password for my server, which I'm not going to tell you obviously. And uh, there we go, now I'm logged in. So, uh, so this is the server. This is your new DigitalOcean droplet on a Unix system and it's ready to go. Now, usually with MOBA Xterm, you have an FTP set up over here, but because it's the first time I logged in, it's not set up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna end this session and I'm gonna create another, a new session. So that same IP address, double clicking on that. It's gonna ask me for the new password that I just created. I'm entering it. I'm gonna say, yes, save it. And uh, now I'm logged in and now I can also use FTP on my server. So I can drag files in and basically do whatever I want. This is why I like MOBA Xterm because you can get access to the terminal and you can get access to FTP at the same time. So now that we have our server set up, the next step is we're gonna be setting up a firewall and setting up SSH private key authentication. So we're gonna disable the ability for users to sign in using a password. The only way they're gonna get access, get, be able to get access to the server is through an, a, a private key. So it's a much, much, much more secure way to set up your server. And that's what they actually recommend in the DigitalOcean documentation. And just for your reference, this is the one that I'm gonna be following to set up the uh, private key authentication. I think this is the firewall stuff too. So this is the one right here, just kind of for your reference. All right, so the first step is we need to create a non-root user. Right now, as you know, I'm signed in with the root user. You can see from the brackets up here, I need to create one that is a non-root user um, because that's just how they recommend setting it up on your server. So I'm gonna type add user and this user's name is gonna be Mitch. So now it's saying enter a new password for Mitch. So I'm just gonna type password enter the, te the password again, uh, full name. I'm just gonna click enter on all these because I'm not gonna enter any of those set those properties. Is this information correct? Yes, it is. So now I have a new user named Mitch. You can double, you can check this by going into the home folder and there'll be a folder um, denoting the user that was created. And um, just so you know, this, so basically this user that was created, they're only gonna be able to alter files within the Mitch folder. So in home and in Mitch, only the root user can change any files, but Mitch, this new user that I created, he's only gonna have access to this folder right here, which is where we're going to be putting our Django project. So kind of just adding more security basically to your application. So I need to give Mitch some permissions so that he can actually do some stuff. So I'm typing user mod dash AG pseudo Mitch, which gives him permission to pretty much do everything. It's pretty close. I'm not sure what they actually are, but you can basically do everything except for 
alter the files outside of the Mitch folder. And yeah, like obviously alter the root user's properties, but you can do a lot of stuff. Now it's time to set up the SSH private keys. So the way that I'm going to do this is I'm gonna open a new command prompt and um, I'm gonna generate a, a public, no, a public key, I'm generating a public key and then I'm using that public key to log into the server and so I'm logging in as a private key to the server. So I'm gonna type SSH keygen and if this is confusing just follow along it's going to make sense in just a sec here so ssh keygen it's saying enter where you want to save it i'm just going to save it there uh, enter a passphrase no passphrase no passphrase so enter three times and it will generate that key so that key gets generated you saw it tells you in the command prompt users users ssh id rsa so if i go into users users ssh this is where that private key was just generated i should have actually I should have actually renamed this to Mitch. Uh, I can rename this to, wait, IDR say, yeah. I'll rename this one to Mitch because this is gonna be the private key, or sorry, the public key for Mitch. So whatever you, the user's name that you just created, that's what you want to name that. And the uh, you also need to generate one for the root user. So I'm gonna go to the command prompt again. I'm gonna type the exact same thing. So I'm just pressing the up arrow on the keyboard, SSH keygen. Um, once again, I'm just gonna click enter three times. That will generate it. And uh, there's that second one. I'm gonna rename this root because this is gonna be the private key for the root user. So I have Mitch and I have my root user. And those are the, sorry, the public keys for their authentication. So now I need to tell my server what these public keys are so first i need to i'm authenticated with the root user so i'm going to right click on this go edit with notepad and here is that that key that was generated i'm going to hit select all so Control a i'm going to copy that i'm going to go back to my server go into for the root user you got to go into root go into ssh and open this authorized keys file so open with default text editor is what you want to do and that's gonna open it with the default text editor that MOBA Xterm uses, which will look like this. And I wanna paste in that key and uh, click enter, and or sorry, and save that. So that's gonna save that private key or the public key as a viable authentication method on the server. And now I, I wanna do the same thing for Mitch. So the root users is in the root folder, but Mitch has to have it inside of this folder right here. So I need to create a new file this is gonna be called authorized keys. Click enter to create that. I'm going to right click, open with the default text editor like we just did. Once we have that, I'm gonna go back to Windows, go into the uh, the Mitch, the Mitch uh, file here, the one that is, I think it's telling me that it's a Microsoft publisher document. So just right click, go to edit with notepad. Once again, select all copy and I wanna paste that in and save that. So now I have these two public keys saved on the server as authentication methods or as viable authentication methods. So I can close that. And of course, if you're watching this, I'm gonna change these keys afterwards. So I might even delete the server anyway. So don't try to log in, it's not gonna work. Um, and now, now that I've done that, I can actually authenticate with those keys and you can test that using a command prompt. So I could do like SSH and I, and I can do at, uh, or sorry, SSH, the user's name is Mitch and I can reference the IP address. So the IP address is 67.205.186.5. And what that'll do is it'll look in the SSH folder on my Windows machine. So it'll look inside this folder and it will look for any public keys that match something on the server. So if I click enter, it says um, auth authenticity of blah, 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 blah. Can't be established. Do you wanna try and connect anyway? It says yes, and then it asks for Mitch's password. So I'm gonna type in Mitch's password. And there you go, now I'm logged into my server. So that wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't added those keys. And you can also test it using the um, using MOBA X term. So if I start a new session here, I can go create a new session, SSH, the remote user is gonna be that IP address. I'm just gonna copy that from DigitalOcean, copying the IP address, pasting that in here. The user's name is gonna be Mitch. I wanna to go to advanced SSH settings and inside private key here, I wanna find Mitch's private key. 
So here's the window it brings up to. Notice I'm in the SSH folder for my computer. I wanna click the one that says Mitch, go open, click OK, and it's gonna authenticate. Oh, it looks like the server refused the key. Interesting, so um, that's obviously wrong. That should not have happened. Uh, oh, it's actually because I, I, I put the authorized key file in the wrong directory. So I need to go to back to the root. Uh, I'm in home, Mitch, and I want to create a new directory with .ssh, and I want to move authorized keys into SSH. So I'm going to just cd into home, Mitch, and I want to move that directory. So I can say sudo move the authorized keys file into home Mitch SSH. So now if I refresh this, notice that authorized keys file is gone. And if I go into SSH, there's the authorized keys file for Mitch. So I'm going to close this session. I'm going to close the Mitch session that I have open here. Yes. And I'm going to open a new one. So if you go to edit session, you should still have the private key referenced right there or the public key, sorry. If I double click this, it should authenticate using the SSH key. And there we go, I'm authenticated. So no password is needed. Now it's authenticating Mitch using SSH. Now, before I move on, I wanna do the same thing with the root user. So I'm gonna end this root user session. So I'm closing this and I'm gonna to go to home and try to, I'm gonna to go to right click on it, edit the session, use advanced SSH settings reference the private key and click on the root user right there, the root user's public key, sorry, go okay. And now try and start that session. So now both Mitch and the root user are able to authenticate using SSH keys instead of using their password. So now that, now that I can do that, and I know that I can log in with the root user using an SSH key, I know that I can log in with Mitch using an SSH key. Now I'm going to disable password authentication on my server. Now you definitely don't wanna do this until you're sure that you're able to authenticate with an SSH key. Because if you do this and you disable the password and you can't get on with the SSH key, you're locked out of your server. You're gonna to have to shut it down and create a new droplet because you won't. it won't be possible to get back onto it. So make sure that you're able to do that. And also keep your SSH keys somewhere safe. Don't just keep it on one drive. Have a backup saved on a USB somewhere. Have it stored, you know, on somewhere else basically because if you lose these you will not be able to get back onto your server so just keep that in mind okay so i'm i'm on the root user session now i'm going to disable password authentication on my server so i'm going to write uh, sudo nano nano means it's like to edit a file in unix land and now i'm going to reference where that file exists so that's in the etc folder in ssh ssh sshd underscore uh, it was config so that's going to open up that file so that i can edit it so i just want to i'm just using the down arrows to go down to where it says password authentication so going down right here so password authentication it's set to yes i'm going to set it to no i'm pressing Control x that'll bring up this little menu down there i'm pressing y for yes and then enter now that saves the file so if I was to reopen that file by doing the exact same thing, and if I, if I was to scroll down to where it says uh, password authentication, notice that it says no. So I'm pressing control X, and I know that now I won't be able to log in with a password. So just keep in mind that if you get locked out of your server at this point, you're basically screwed. You have to restart your droplet. So make sure to keep those, those private keys somewhere where you're not gonna use them, lose them. All right, so now we are gonna set up a very basic firewall. And again, I believe if you refer to the DigitalOcean documentation, I think it's part of firewall. I think it's, yeah, setting up a basic firewall. So that's gonna be just kind of following these steps here. It's very simple. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, so all you gotta do is sudo UFW app list. So that will show you what kind of available applications there are. There's just one at this point. I want to make sure that SSH is enabled. So you can see that it's available. Now I need to make sure that it's enabled. So UFW allow open SSH. So it says my rules are updated. I want to now enable the firewall. So UFW enable. This may disrupt current connections. Yes, I want to proceed. Cool, the firewall is active and enabled on the system, on system startup and right now. I want to do sudo UFW status and that will show you what is currently active. So that's open SSH is active and I have an active firewall. 
So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to install and enable Python 3.7. Right now on the server, if you type Python, you can see that, uh, actually it's Python 3, you can see what version it has pre-installed. It comes with 3.6.8. So uh, currently you could use 3.6.8, but because in the course, in the Django web development course, we were using version 3.7, I want to stay consistent and also use 3.7 on our system. So it's pretty simple to do. Basically there's two steps. I need to install Python and then I need to tell the server that I want to use the, the Python 3.7 instead of Python 3.6. So first I'm gonna write sudo apt update, and that basically just updates a whole bunch of stuff on the system. They recommend doing that in the documentation all the time, so I'm just gonna do it ahead of time. Once these are done, all of these updates are done, now I'm going to install Python 7. So sudo apt install, it'll be Python 3.7. And uh, yes, I wanna continue. That's going to install that for me. And once Python 3.7 is installed, um, and I can confirm that in just a second. I can confirm that by writing Python 3.7, and there you go, it's, it's, it works, so it actually does something. That means that you can tell from what it says right here, Python 3.7.3, that means it's installed. Uh, now that it's installed, I need to tell my server to use that version instead of using Python 3.6 by default. So to do that, you write sudo update dash alternatives, whoops, that's an equal sign, so dash alternatives, dash dash install, and I want to reference the path for uh, where the, those Python versions are installed. So user bin Python space Python, and then user bin Python 3.6.2. That's the version that's already pre-installed. So clicking enter there. Oh, whoops. Uh, so there should be, it's not point two at the end, it's space two. So what I'm doing is I'm telling this, this file on my system to give Python 3.6 a priority of level two. So I'm, do, I'm entering there and it says that it was updated. Now I wanna do the same thing, but I wanna reference the new version of Python that I installed. So 3.7 and I wanna give it a priority of one. So this first Python 3.6 is getting a priority of two. This one's saying Python 3.7 is getting a priority of one. So clicking enter. So now that's that's um, updated my configuration file. Now the last step is I need to set um, the version that I wanna use. So once again, update alternatives and dash dash config Python. So now it's gonna give me an option to choose which one I want to use. It says that Python 3.7 is selection number two. See there's selection number two, there's Python 3.7. I'm hitting enter there. And now, now if I was to just type Python, notice that it uses version 3.7. So the default version of Python that will be used on my server will be version 3.7. We're almost ready to start setting up the Django stuff. So to start using that, we need pip. If you remember from the course, we use pip to install different Python packages or modules, I think you call them. So we need to install uh, pip on our server. So sudo apt get install y python3 dash pip. That is the command to install pip for Python 3. So I'm clicking enter. It's gonna install a bunch of stuff. And uh, when it's done, we're going to confirm that uh, pip was installed. Okay, so now that that's all done, let's check that pip was installed. So I'm typing pip3. And if it doesn't say anything, you know that you have a problem. But if it gives you kind of all these options that pop up, you know that pip was correctly installed on your system. So now that, now that pip's installed, we need to install some Python packages with pip. So the first one is going to be the Python virtual environment, which we used when we uh, when we worked with our development environment. We're going to be using it for some testing on our server before we actually launch the project. So I'm typing uh, sudo h-h pip3 install virtual environment, clicking enter, and that's going to install virtual environment on my server. Now I want to cd, so I want to navigate to the directory home mitch. So if you want to see that on the FTP, that means I went into home and I went into Mitch. So now I'm inside this directory right here and you can see it says home Mitch and uh, you can type LS to list any of the directories that are inside here, but there is none as these are all hidden directories that won't be listed. 
So at this point, you could either you could use the Mitch session or you could use the root user session because we're going to be inside of the Mitch directory. So the user Mitch will have access to everything in here. But I think I'm just going to stick with the root user session, but do do whichever you like. So now we're going to start setting up our Django project. So I'm going to write make directory. So M-K-D-I-R. This is going to be Django project directory. And it's uh, I think it's very important that you name them exactly the same as I am because later when we do the G-Unicorn, setup for the socket and the service um, it's just going to be easier for you to follow along if you name everything exactly the same as what I'm naming it so you can name them differently but I'm I'm just kind of giving you uh, trying to get trying to help you out here and prevent you from running into issues just name everything the same and then maybe later when you launch your next website you can name things differently so make directory Django project now if I type LS you can see that I have a, a new directory in there called Django project dir directory. So I'm going to navigate into that directory. So Django project dir. If you didn't know what I did there, I just typed dj and then tab and it fills it in for me. So I'm going into that directory. Now this directory is empty, as you can see if I type ls. So now I want to create that virtual environment. So virtual env, I'm going to call it Django project environment. So once again, you should probably name these the same as what I'm naming them. So virtual ENV Django project environment. And that is going to create a new virtual environment inside of my Django project directory. So if I write LS now, you can see that there's that Django project environment. If I CD into Django project environment and I use LS again, I have bin, include, and lib. So if I refresh this, there's that Django project environment or Django project directory, Django project environment. And inside here is how you activate the virtual environment. So there's that activate file right there. That will be actually how you activate it. So what I want to do is I can actually CD back. So CD space dot dot will bring me back one directory. So I'm no longer in the Django project environment. I'm in the Django project directory. And now I can activate that virtual environment by writing source Django project environment slash bin and referencing that activate file that I just talked about. So if I click enter, now we get we get our um, virtual environment activated and you know it's activated because this is surrounded in brackets over here. So that's how you can kind of confirm that it's working correctly. So the reason that I'm using a virtual environment is because we want to do some testing before we actually install all of the things that we need to on the actual server. So in, we're gonna work on the virtual environment first, confirm some things are working, and then work on the actual server. So I want to install gunicorn first. So pip3 install gunicorn. And uh, if you don't know what gunicorn is, I don't really have a good way to explain it. I'm not really a Unix guy, I'm not a server guy. Um, but basically it's needed to host your server. If you want more information on it, just Google it. Google will be able to give you a better answer than I will. Next, I want to install Django. So pip3 install Django, and we're using version 2.2.2. So I'm installing that. And uh, now that we have this, we have Gunicorn installed, we have Django installed, we have everything that I need to move forward and test to make sure that everything's working correctly. So I'm gonna do cd space dot dot, which will take me back a directory. So I'm inside of the Mitch directory now. And now I want to create that project. So Django admin start project, start project, and it's gonna be called my site. So remember to name things exactly the way I'm naming them. Django project directory. So I'm creating a new project called my site inside of Django project directory. So if I click enter and I do LS. Now I have that Django project directory still there. If I CD into Django project directory, I have the manage.py file and I have that my site. So I can also just check that out through the FTP. So if I go into Django project directory, there's my site, the virtual environment and the manage.py file. So I'm CDing back into Mitch which actually I don't need to do. You don't need to CD into the Mitch directory. It doesn't matter because now at this point, we're ready to move our files from the project that we built in my Django course, my web development course. We're gonna move them onto the server. Um, but before I actually do that, we need to edit the settings.py file. So I'm gonna go into settings.py, open with the default text editor for the server. So it'll, it'll look something like this and we need to change a few things. So inside of the allowed hosts section right here, I want to allow the IP address for the server and I also want to allow local host. 
So there's local host. Now I want to get the IP address for the server. So I'm going to my DigitalOcean droplet. I'm going to copy that IP address. I'm going to paste it in there. So that's the first thing that we need to do. Um, next, we need to change a few other stuff. So inside of installed apps, we need to add all the Django apps that we built in the course. So I'm going to write a little heading here that just says my apps. And there's personal is one of the apps. Uh, another one is account. And then the other, the third one, the last one is blog or it's, yeah, it's blog, not blogs. So those are the apps that we built in the course. Next, I need to set the auth user model. So auth user model equals account dot account. And of course we haven't dragged these into the project yet, but we're going to in just a second. I just wanted to edit the settings file first. Um, coming down into templates, we need to reference the directory for where the templates are going to be stored. So os.path.join the base directory and then comma and its name is templates. So I'm making sure that I didn't make any spelling mistakes there. OS path join base directory, which is referencing the base directory up, up top here. Templates is the name of the folder where all the templates are. So that should be good. App directories is true. And the static file stuff we also need to type in down here. So I'm actually just going to copy this from Sublime Text from our project. So I'm going into my site, going into settings, scrolling down to the bottom. And uh, we don't need all of these, but I'm just going to copy those paste those in. We don't need the media URL. We don't need the media root and don't need media there. So all I have is static files directories referencing the static directory. There's a static directory path there and then static CDN, which we're going to be removing later when we do the uh, Amazon Web Services stuff. But just for now, we need to add those. So I'm pressing control S to save that. You can see that it's being saved down here in MOBA X term. And uh, there we go. Oh, also, actually, before we move on, you're, you're going to want to change debug equal to false when you're in a production environment. Um, just for now, I'm going to leave it set to true, but just keep that in mind. If I forget to tell you later, make sure to change that to false, because if it's set to true, it's uh, kind of a big security risk. They can see a lot of properties on your server if there's ever an error or something like that. So only use that very selectively if you need to debug something. But for now, I'm going to be leaving that to true. All right, so now let's drag in the files for the server. So I'm going to the Django project directory and I want to drag in all the files that we built that we built in the web development course that I made. So I'm going to where I have the Django project. So Django project coding with Mitch blog course. I'm going to go into SRC and basically I just want to drag everything. In. So I'm going to select account, hold down control, click on blog, hold down control, click on personal, click on templates. I need requirements.txt. So I'm going to drag all of those into my server right there. It should take a few seconds to get going. Keep in mind, you must be on the root user to be able to do that, dragging all that stuff in. And I also need to edit the urls.py file. So I need to, I think I, I just want to, I'll just actually copy the whole thing in. So I'm pressing control, or actually I'll drag it in. So as soon as this is done, I'm going to drag in the urls.py. So I'm going to my site, I'm going to delete this urls.py. So I'm deleting that. And now I'm going to drag in this urls.py. Now I'm going back a directory, and I'm going to create a new directory called static. So I have that static directory that's created. And I want to drag in the coding with Mitch logo uh, into the static directory. So I'm going into static, I'm going into static on the server, and I'm going to drag in this logo because we will need that on our website. And I believe that is it. Oh, I need to actually remove one more thing. So go into my site, open up urls.py. So opening with the default text editor. And I want to remove the media root stuff down here. And I'm just going to press control S to save that. And that should be should be good. So there there's all the files that we need on our server. Now I'm going to install the requirements. So all the requirements that we use for the project. So I'm going to do pip3 install dash r requirements. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory. So I need to cd into Django project directory. Now I have access to the manage.py file. So, or sorry, the requirements file. So pip3 install negative r requirements.txt and I'm clicking enter. Now it's going to go through the requirements file and install all the re requirements for the project. Uh, now it's time to migrate. So Python manage.py, 
I'm going to type migrate. Actually, I might have to make migrations. So I'll type make migrations first. Looks like I have, so I did make a typo inside of settings.py. So if I open up settings.py, go to templates, it's telling me that I have, oh, I forgot a bracket here. So fixing that, pressing control S to save that. Now I'm gonna to try to make migrations again as soon as this is saved. So make migrations, no change detected. Okay, Python manage.py migrate. That's gonna set up my database and everything that I need in there. Now I wanna write python manage.py collect static, which will collect all the static files. So now if I was to refresh this, I should have a static CDN folder that gets generated and there's all the static files. So that's good. Now I want to sudo ufw allow eight port 8000. So I'm telling my firewall to allow port 8000. Now I want to run my server. So python manage.py run server 0.0.0. .0. And remember, this is just for testing. We're just testing G Unicorn right now. Later, you will not need to actually run the server to, to um, get to keep things working. It just automatically runs using G Unicorn, G Unicorn and Nginx. So now that that server, it now our server should be running. So if I go to um, my IP address, so I need to copy my DigitalOcean IP address, go to port 8000. Now my website should be live. Okay, so that's good. We we manually ran our server. Now we need to make sure that GUnicorn is working correctly and it's able to actually run the server alone without us having to to do run server. So I press control C to stop the server. And now I want to write G unicorn bind 0, 0.0.0 .0 port 8000 to my site dot WSGI. WS my site dot WSGI. There we go. So clicking enter, it says no module named my site dot W. So it looks like I typed something wrong my site oh yeah i did type it wrong wsgi there we go so now if i go to our server again it should still be running which it is so i can go to the admin it's kind of slow but it should still be running i don't know why it's slow when you test it with Unicorn like this i'm not really sure but the the whole point of this is just to see if you're actually able to see your server if it is that means that basically you have the correct things installed and we can move forward to the next step. And it took a while, like I said, but there we go, we see our admin. So we know that we're good to go and we're ready to move on to the next step. So I'm pressing control C to stop that and uh, let's move on to what's next. All right, so the next step is we create a system socket and all the service files for G Unicorn and Nginx to run the server without us having to actually run the server like we just did. So we, we aren't gonna be using a virtual environment anymore. We aren't going to be running the server manually. We're gonna be relying on Nginx and GUnicorn to host our server. So I'm gonna be, I followed this, this uh, tutorial in the DigitalOcean documentation, if you're curious, so you can search this. Of course, we're not using a Postgres database. We're using SQLite, but other than that, it's pretty much the same. So the step that we're on is down here, right here. So creating system, D socket, and service files for GUnicorn. So we've tested GUnicorn like we just did to interact with our Django application, but now we need to implement a more robust way of starting and stopping the application server. So to do that, to do that, we use GUnicorn and Nginx. So if you're curious, you can follow their guide here, but I'm gonna be showing you everything you need to know. All right, so first thing is we wanna deactivate our virtual environment, and I want to install everything that we just installed in the virtual environment onto the actual server. So I'm installing G Unicorn, so pip3 install G Unicorn, pip3 install Django equals 2.2.2. I could have actually just installed the requirements, but that's fine, I'll do that now. So pip3 install our requirements.txt, so I'm just installing everything that I need to. Uh, and now once that's done, now we're gonna set up G Unicorn. We're gonna build some configuration files that we need for G Unicorn to run our server, to host our web server. So I need to navigate. So make sure you're logged in with the root user because we're gonna be creating some files. So I'm navigating to the ETC folder, going into system D, 
So wherever system system D is right here, going into system, and here's where we need to add our G Unicorn configuration files. The first one is called, so I'm creating a new file named gunicorn.socket. This one's the easy one. This is the one you probably won't have any problems with. It's the next one we'll see. If you're gonna have any problems, it's gonna be with that one. So this one's called gunicorn.socket. So if you want to, you can copy this out on video or inside of the doc, the doc that I mentioned, there's uh, basically a template here that you can just copy. So the first one right here is the gunicorn socket uh, file. So you need to copy this and that's what's gonna get pasted in here. So it's literally just word for word. I didn't change a single thing. You can change the description if you want, like you, you could do gunicorn socket for Django application or whatever, doesn't matter. But uh, the point is that you have this kind of unit heading, this socket heading, this install heading. It should look exactly like this. It should look identical. So I press Control C and or Control S and I save that. Next is the service, the G Unicorn service file. If you're going to have any issues, it's going to be with this one. I had I had a lot of issues trying to set this up, um, but if so, if you just follow exactly what I've been doing and you named your directories exactly the way that I did, then everything should work fine here. So it's called G. Whoops, I almost spelled it wrong. G Unicorn dot service. In creating that file, now I'm going to right click. Whoops, right click on that file. Go to open with the default text editor. And uh, like I said, there's a template in here that you can follow. So referencing that doc, or you can go to, uh, actually I won't have it on the source code, but um, yeah, go to the docs I recommend, and you can just scroll down to the lowest point. You wanna copy this whole thing. So there's a unit heading, there's a service heading, and there's an install heading. And we're gonna need to change some of these things. So copy it and paste it in, whoops. But, uh, but we do need to change some things. So let's take a look here. So nothing in unit needs to be changed. This stuff is identical. You don't need to change that. But the user needs to be changed to whatever the user that you created on the server is named. So uh, like remember we created this Mitch user and Mitch has a uh, directory inside of home. So home and Mitch, whatever you named this user, that's what needs to go in, in the uh, user parameter right here. The group stays the same and the working directory you need to change. So Mitch is the user. This is going to be Django project directory. Remember, if you name, hopefully you named everything exactly how I did, because then you you won't have to change any of this. Um, this is Mitch. This is Django project directory. This is Django project env. So home Mitch Django project directory Django project environment bin g unicorn. There's g unicorn installed in the virtual environment. There, it's also installed on the server, but that's fine. We can reference the one that was in the virtual environment. Uh, all this stuff is the same, this is the same, and this needs to be changed to my site. So my site.wsgi colon application, and that should be it. So if you named everything the same as I did, other than maybe the user, um, it should look exactly like this. Okay, so now you have these gunicorn service and socket um, files set up. We can go to our server. You can either go to the Mitch user or the root user, whichever one you prefer and we are going to basically enable everything. So first thing is we need to start the socket and then you wanna start the service. So sir, you wanna do sudo systemctl start gunicorn.socket. Looks like I typed it wrong, it should be system. Systemctl start gunicorn socket. So that's going to start the socket. Next is sudo systemctl enable gunicorn.socket. So that's good. And now we want to confirm that the socket is working correctly. So what you can do is check for a file that will have been generated. So we want to do file run gunicorn.sock. And if you get an output here, that means that the, the file was generated. You can also check just by looking at the FTP. So if you go into run, uh, and then you should see that, um, you want to go into run and you should see gunicorn.sock. That file won't be there if you didn't set it up correctly. So if you have that file, you know that it should be uh, working correctly. Now that you have the socket enabled and started, you can check the status of the socket. So sudo system ctl status gunicorn.socket. And this is what you should see. Don't worry if this says failed, That's this is irrelevant. Don't worry about that. The thing you wanna see is that it's active, it's listening, it's enabled and this is enabled. If you see what I see here, that means that your socket 
is active, it's listening, it's ready to go. It's ready for a service to be bound to it, which is gonna be the next step. Just as kind of an FYI, if if for some reason your gunicorn.soc file did not get generated, uh, you can try doing sudo shutdown slash dash r now, and that will, that will shut down your server and it will reset it. Just keep in mind that when you go to log back in, it might take like maybe 20 seconds for your server to restart. So don't panic if you can't get on it right away. But if you don't have your file, you definitely need that file to move forward. So try resetting your server. Next is the, the service file. So remember I was talking about that gunicorn service file and if you're gonna have problems, it's gonna be with the service file. So now is the time to work with that. So this gunicorn service. So do, you have to be very careful with what you type here because if you make a mistake, you have to reset your server. So it's a very kind of finicky process. I had a lot of trouble with this. So follow very carefully. So, um, so first of all, we want to activate the service or I'm not sure what the exact kind of terminology is, but it's something along the lines of you want to bind the service to the socket to uh, get everything up and running, I guess. I'm not really sure of the exact terminology, uh, but this is what you want to do. So you want to do curl dash dash unix dash socket. And this is all outlined in the documentation, by the way. So if you're confused, um, checking the gunicorn socket file, testing socket activation, that's going to be this. That's exactly what I'm doing right here. So if you get confused, you can check out the documentation and uh, see what they're saying about it. So suit um, curl unix socket, I want to do slash run slash gunicorn.soc. So I'm referencing that gunicorn.soc and I want to write local host. So make sure, so this, this is kind of the moment of truth. If you're going to have a problem, it's going to be right here. So if I click enter, let's see what happens. If you don't see the HTML for your website printing out, then you know you have a problem. If you see anything except for the HTML, um, what I suggest is going back and rewatching the socket setup stuff. Um, yeah, going back and, and rewatching the socket setup stuff and then also doing sudo shutdown dash r now to reset your server and kind of reset things because uh, check check your your G Unicorn socket file. Check your G Unicorn service file because if there's a if there's a problem, um, it's going to be apparent right here. If there's no HTML, that means you either set this file up wrong, or you set this file up wrong, or something is named incorrectly. Something is wrong with the way you set it up. So you're going to have to go back and figure out what it is. And unfortunately, there's no kind of uh, easy way to be like, okay, if it's this, then go fix this. If it's this, then go fix this. You kind of got to check over everything because any error that you see is going to be very vague and it's going to be very hard for you to figure out exactly what the problem is. So all you can do is just go back and rewatch. Also, if you change, if you change this G unicorn service file, if you, uh, uh, you can either shut down your server or you can try doing sudo system CTL daemon reload and that will re that will kind of reset things and then after that you also want to write sudo systemctl restart gunicorn.socket and gunicorn.service so try if you make any changes to the gunicorn service file or the gunicorn socket file you need to write those two commands and uh, i just recommend restarting your server i think that would be best so that means um that means doing uh, sudo shutdown r now. It'll take about 20 seconds for your server to restart, and then you can just reconnect, and that'll kind of start you with a fresh slate. So I, I would just restart your server. I think that's that's easier. So now the, the last step is we want to make sure that the service is running. So if you see the HTML, you know everything's good. Next, you want to write sudo systemctl status gunicorn so you're checking the status of the gunicorn service if this is what you see and you see that it's active and running that's awesome you should be very happy because if there's a problem it would have already happened so you know that everything is working correctly so i'm pressing Control c because everything on my end seems to be working correctly like i said if you're getting any issues you're going to need to go back, check your gunicorn service file, check your socket file, make sure that all of these directories are correct. Make sure, yeah, basically just go, you're going to have to go and rewatch and make sure, like I said, name the directories exactly the way I did. That may, that way you won't have any issues. So if you made it this far, you're good and you're ready to move on to the next step, which is going to be configuring engine X to proxy pass gunicorn, which is the next step in the docs if you were to refer here. So configure Nginx to proxy pass gunicorn. So just like gunicorn, I don't really know a lot about Nginx. I'm not like a, a Unix admin guy. I'm not super 
experience with web development. So if you want to know more about Nginx, I suggest just Googling it. That's going to be, uh, it's going to give you way more information than I could. So I just, it's just, just know if you don't care, just know that it's a web server and it's commonly associated or it's commonly used in conjunction with G-Unicorn to host websites. And yeah, like I said, Google it if you want to know more. So currently we don't have Nginx installed. So we, that's the first step. We need to install Nginx. So I'm write sudo apt install Nginx and that will install Nginx on my server. I click Y for yes. Uh, make sure that you're you're on the root user session because again we're going to be editing some files. So I'm going to etc and instead of uh, system D I want to go to Nginx. There should be an Nginx uh, folder now that I've installed Nginx. I want to go into here and I want to go into uh, it's sites available. Yeah, sites available. No, sites. Yeah, sites available. And we need to create a file here. This is going to be an Nginx configuration file. So I'm right. Or I'm clicking on here. I'm going to give this new file a name. It's going to be called Django Project. Again, I highly recommend naming things exactly the way that I'm naming them, so you don't have any issues. I'm editing this with the default text editor and uh, I need to add some add some uh, code in here. So this code can be found in the docs just like when we made the other um, G-Unicorn settings files. So if you're following along here, you can just copy, you wanna copy this whole thing. So etc, nginx, sites available, my project. In our case, that's the Django project. So I'm highlighting that, copying it, going back, pasting that in, and I need to change a few things here. The first one is the server IP or the domain. So later we're gonna be adding a domain, but right now we just have an IP address. So I'm copying the IP address from DigitalOcean. I'm going to paste that in there. Um, and the rest of this needs, this needs to be changed to home, Mitch, and this is gonna be Django project directory. And the rest of this is fine. So all you need to change is the IP address and changing the root directory to home, Mitch, Django project directory. And we are gonna to need to come back and make some more changes to this file later on when we, uh, when we purchase a domain and also when we host our static files using DigitalOcean Spaces and Amazon Web Services. But for now, this is what our configuration file is gonna look like. So control S to save it or clicking the little save button there. And now I need to link this file to, I basically need to link this file to the sites enabled folder. So I'm gonna write a command down here in the server. So I wanna write sudo ln negative s etc nginx sites sites available uh, Django project, which is the name of the file that we just created. And then I wanna reference the sites available folder. So etc nginx nginx, I think I spelled that right, and then sites enabled. So just double checking this to make sure I typed it, sudo ln negative s etc nginx sites available Django project, and I'm linking that to sites enabled. So sites available linked to sites enabled. So what that did is it generated the file inside of sites enabled. You can double check and you can see that the, the file is in there now. Now you can check the nginx setup by writing sudo nginx negative t. And if it says that the test is successful, you know that you set it up correctly. Um, so if there are no errors, you can restart Nginx. If there is some errors, then you need to go and figure out what those, those are. You need to go back and rewatch the steps that I just took. So if there's no errors, you want to do sudo systemctl restart Nginx. That will restart Nginx. And now I need to change the firewall port to allow Nginx instead of port 8000, which is what we were doing for testing. So sudo ufw, I wanna delete allow 8000. So it's deleting the port 8000 from the firewall. Now I want to do sudo ufw allow uh, Nginx full. So I think um, the spelling here matters. So make sure you capitalize the N, capitalize the F, I think it does, I'm not sure, but to be safe, I would just have it exactly how I have it. Click enter and then that will allow um, traffic through your firewall, firewall through Nginx. So at this point, we should be able to visit our website using the IP address if you've been doing everything correctly. So I'm copying the IP address, I'm opening a new tab, I'm going to paste that in, and uh, there is our server up and running. Now, so at this point, you have your server hosted by your IP address, you should have all 
everything working the way you had in our, in our development environment, but there's still a long, a lot of things to do. There's still a long way to go. Number one is we still need a service to host the static files. So that means the, the blog images for our blog blogging application or our, our blogging website, those files can't be hosted on your DigitalOcean server. They need to be hosted somewhere else. We're going to be using DigitalOcean spaces for that and uh, which in conjunction with Amazon Web Services. So we still need to do that. Number two is we still need to purchase a domain name and we need to associate that with our IP address. So just like coding with coningwithmitch.com, that is an, that's a domain name. That domain name is pointed to the IP address. Right now, all we have is an IP address. So we need to set that up still. And number three is we need to set up HTTPS. So right now, when I visit my IP address, there's no like security. Technically, right now, all the information, including passwords, are being sent over the network in plain text. So that's obviously a very, very bad way to do things. If you use HTTPS, just like codingwithmitch.com is, everything is encrypted. So there's no, nothing is being passed through a text file, which is obviously very insecure. So, um, so those are the three things we're going to do. Uh, set up static files using AWS and DigitalOcean Spaces. Uh, purchase a domain name and associate it with the IP address. And then number three is set up HTTPS.